I'm Sarah Pembra, and this is the story behind my story. You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mock, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Sarah Pembra. Thanks for tuning in to Author Stories. You can find all of the archives of the show at hankgarner.com. And when you're there, click on the subscribe buttons in the right-hand sidebar. There's uh, places where you can subscribe in iTunes and Google Play and Stitcher Radio and even YouTube, hankgarner.com. I'd like to thank some sponsors to, that make this show possible, Grammarly. Go to getgrammarly.com slash hank to sign up uh, for your free account Grammarly, uh, built by linguists and language lovers, Grammarly's writing app finds and corrects hundreds of complex writing errors, so you don't have to. Grammarly corrects hundreds of grammar, punctuation, and spelling mistakes while also catching contextual errors, impri- improving your vocabulary, and suggesting style improvements. Go to getgrammarly.com slash Hank when you're working on that new book before you send it to your final editor. Uh, let Grammarly take a pass at it. Uh, you'd be surprised at what it'll catch, and your editor will thank you for it. Brand new from Stefan Bolt's The White Dragon Omnibus Edition. This book has been two years in the making for those of us that have been following along as Stefan has released the books Genesis, Crucible, and Alchemy. We have been on the edge of our seats waiting to see how he would finish the series. And now you can read it all in one volume. No waiting. Genesis, Crucible, and Alchemy. The White Dragon series by Stefan Bolt's. Available now. There's links to it in the show notes. Untold Deception by William Stakos I looked up. The executioner pulled the lever. Her body fell, and the crowd cheered. I couldn't watch the rest, so I lowered my eyes to the ground. I think I understand now. I get it, Mom. I now know what it means to grow up. Untold Deception by William Stakos is a book full of magic, coming-of-age story, and a story about family. Check out the link in the show notes, Untold Deception by William Stakos. Stay tuned after the show for an audiobook clip for Richard Glebe's The Jason Crane Series. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm super excited to have Sarah Pinbro on the show with me today. She has a brand new book called Cross Her Heart. Uh, it's out available everywhere now, hardcover, Kindle, audiobook. Uh, this book is phenomenal. And if you are familiar with Sarah, uh, maybe you know her previous book, Behind Her Eyes, which was also uh, phenomenal. Uh, Sarah, I'm super excited to talk to you today. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. Yes. Uh, we begin each show with the same question. And that question oh <laughs> and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Oh, good Lord. You know, I'm quite old now, so this is going back a while. <laughs> <laughs> I don't um, believe it. I, I, do you know, I remember writing stories when I was about three or four. I was at school in Damascus. Um, my dad was working over there. So I was at an American school. I actually sounded American for the first eight years of my life. Um, and I think because we didn't really have TV we could watch. Well, we could watch it, but we couldn't understand it. So we had to make up stories to go along with the pictures on the screen because it was all in Arabic. Um, so I think from then I kind of was already making up stories very young. And it kind of was always going to be either writing or acting. And then I realized that to be an actress, you had to not eat cake, (laughs) Uh, get up early and exercise for hours a day. And I thought, you know what? Being a writer, you can sit in your pajamas (laughs) on the sofa, smeared in pizza with Netflix on the background. Uh, So that was the way I chose. (laughs) I I love that there were two choices, uh, writing or acting. (laughs) Oh, but those were my kind of heart choices, you know? Well, that I think that that gets down to the core of uh, that you were born a storyteller, and you were going to tell stories either by writing them or or uh, acting them and, and yeah. presenting them to to people in that in that manner. 
Yeah, that's probably true. Or I was just a show off. <laughs> well, there's always that too. There's always that. Uh, and I, I think if you had the Venn diagram of show off and uh, artistic pursuits, I think they, there's a lot of overlap there. Yeah, there is. There is. We <laughs> pretend to be all shy and arty, but actually, it's just look at me. Right. Right. Oh, I'm a. I'm a. Uh, I'm an arty. Uh, uh, introvert right, right. yeah okay. exactly yeah. <laughs> yeah they're always very loud about being introverts <laughs> it's, oh, ow, oh we're just we're just gonna step on toes today aren't we <laughs> so so sarah how did you uh how did you pursue your writing uh you knew that you were gonna do it uh what was your your path to uh, did you did you study writing uh no, no no not at all um i had a very wayward youth you know, I really did. I went to university by the skin of my teeth, but this was only after running away with with a much older man who at the time was wanted for murder. Um, he didn't do it, but he was wanted for questioning for murder. And uh, we ran away to Spain and my dad had to come and drag me home. And, you know, and then I went to uni and then I got a job running a strip club. And, I, you know, I was doing all kinds of interesting things and hanging out with the Rolling Stones. So the as writing, you do. Kind of, as you do, the writing kind of, by the wayside because I felt like I was living in a novel you know and then you reach that stage when you're about 25 26 and think I'm too old and tired for this you know right. so um I started to write some short stories I'd always kind of had little notebooks where I put little things down but hadn't really focused and then I started to write some short stories and I sent one to this this was I mean we're going back to sort of the 90s so it's pre-internet no self-publishing no twitter no facebook so you had these little, you know, those kind of little fanzines and, um, you know, all small, uh, small press kind of stuff. Oh, and right. I sent a short story to this. I can't remember what it was called. I think it might have been called Enigmatic Tales or something in England. And it was quite pretentious. But I sent this short story off and they wrote me a letter that said, you can't write. You'll never be a writer. <laughs> <laughs> which I, I really wish I'd kept um, and that periodical actually went out of print not long after and so you know I'm sticking my little finger up at them uh, so that kind of knocked my confidence to be honest for a little while um, and then when I was about 28 I went to Vegas to ill-advisedly get married <laughs> um, and on the way back I, well, I'd started to have an idea for a horror novel because obviously I sort of I grew up with that very horror background, Stephen King, James Herbert, Clive Barker. You know, I was very much into that sort of writing. Um, and I picked up a, a leisure, a Dorchester publishing leisure novel, and they wrote they published a lot of um, mass market horror fiction. So I picked that up and I thought, ah, oh, well, I know horror is not really selling in England. Maybe if I write this book, I can send it to them. And I did. And they bought it, which was kind of a weirdly quick way in. Uh, but then I was kind of stuck with them for six years. And they were notoriously terrible publishers. Um, but that was my start. Yeah, sorry, I've rambled at you. Oh, oh no, no, that that's perfect. <laughs> um, can you tell me I live alone with my dog? <laughs> <I'm so much> <laughs> So you you began writing horror, uh, and I think you said that that you were you were that kind of reader. You you gravitated toward uh, oh, as those... a child, massively, massively. I was I never slept because I was always terrified of the dark. <laughs> but I still loved you know I, when I went to boarding school, I was always reading those pan book of horror, and you know all my stories have an edge of dark in them, an right. edge of something a little bit off kilter. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, and then. I mean, I always felt a bit sorry for James Herbert because, especially in England, you know, we all devoured his novels. And then Stephen King came along and it was kind of like, yeah, see ya. <laughs> uh, and so we all kind of morphed over to Stephen King fan. Uh, so I used to, I mean, religiously get every book of his at Christmas and, you know, read it. So I think it was natural that that was where I was going to first go as a writing genre you know because i've sort of loved it so much and i still love watching horror films and stuff i don't read a lot of horror fiction now but i do read i do watch a lot of horror films why do we do that to ourselves sarah uh read these <laughs> things that terrify us and we can't sleep at night and then uh um, we, we we pick up the next one and, <laughs> and I, remember, a, I remember putting it i was at boarding school and i put the book it in my drawer at night because i couldn't even have it on <laughs> 
outside of my bed. And I didn't sleep with a window open, which, you know, given that I lived in Africa for four years with very limited air conditioning, I wouldn't sleep with a window open after eating Salem's Lot for, I think, till I was about 21. I ended up doing my university dissertation on the role of the vampire as an exploration of um, society's ills, I think it was, or problems in society, so that I would cure myself of this fear of vampires. So, yeah, I still dream about vampires. It's crazy. It's like this self inoculation. Uh, the <laughs> to to uh, we we take a little bit that we can control uh, to to maybe ward off the things we can't control. Plus, we are going to so be ready when that vampire pops <laughs> up. That's right. That's right. Um, to to jump ahead in your story uh, just a little bit, uh, Stephen King uh, blurbed uh, your, your previous friend. book behind <laughs> her eyes uh, and called it bloody brilliant. Uh, what was that like to well, have to have Stephen this, King talk about your book? This is going to sound really cocky, um, but it was the second book of mine that it read and blurbed. <laughs> Because the first one, I was, I remember being at home and I wrote this book called The Death House, which is a dystopian teenage love story. And it wasn't out in America then. It, and it, isn't, it, it didn't get, it didn't sort of hit the bestsellers list or anything over here. It was quite a small book. Um, and then I went on Twitter and I was seeing my name and Stephen King and the New York Times all in the same tweets. And I was thinking, well, this is never out. What is this? This is something very strange is going on here. So I tracked it back and he had, um, read it and said what a great book it was in the New York Times. Uh, but I couldn't figure out how he'd even got it. And then someone I know, an American editor, Bev Vincent, said, oh, I gave him a copy and told him he'd love it. So that at that moment, I did have a little cry. I'm not going to... I'm not going to lie, I was quite emotionally moved by that. So when he read Behind Her Eyes as well, that was obviously a double bonus, you know. But the, that moment when he'd read um, The Death House, I was like... And then I went to his son's wedding in Boston at Joe Hill's wedding. And he came over and said to me, I'm a big fan of your work. And it was like 14 year old me who was so worried about her weight and her curly hair. If you could just hear this now. <laughs> but Stephen, I've had cake. Even 46 year old me who's still worried about her thighs and her curly hair. It was like, Oh my gosh, this is amazing. Oh, that is so amazing. That uh... it's those things are your touchstone moments, aren't they? For all the business side of it and if it sells well or whatever, it's the idea that someone who was your sort of hero could have yeah. liked what you've written is kind of great. Yeah. yeah. It, it really is this, this weird, um, thing where, where we all oh. want. Sorry, that's my uh, dog. Bark. Oh, he's he's fine, <laughs> or, or she's fine. Oh, uh, it, it's this weird thing where we all want success, and we we tell these stories, and, and we hope people read them. Um, mm. But when when we make that personal connect, especially with a hero uh, like Stephen King, or, or just when you get feedback from a reader that says, you know, your book really got me in a deep place, like that's that's really what makes it all worth it, isn't it? Especially when you kind of you know come up from sort of genre presses to sort of more mainstream and it's people you don't know who are saying it and you're like oh that's great you know so even I was having some work done in my house and um the plasterer the guy who came to do my fireplace he said what's well, so name's Pimber and I said yeah he goes you didn't write behind her eyes did you and I said yeah he said oh I just finished that on my kindle and I was like this is just the weirdest thing because normally you know I've written so many books before that book and 13 minutes people had read, but aside from that, people would go, would, have you written anything I might have read? And I'd be like, no. <laughs> and now it's kind of weird if people have read it, you know? That is. Like, that's so amazing. Mm -hmm. um, so you said that you were with this publisher and it, it didn't have a great reputation, but uh, did you did you say that you published six books with them? Yeah, I was kind of, I was right. They wanted straight horror and I was writing them. Um, and they didn't pay well, but what they did do, to be fair, they were, you know, it was a mass market paperback publisher in America, and they got you in all the kind of Walmart and the PX stores and all that sort of stuff. Um, and, you know, I kind of honed my chops a bit with them, but the editorial side was not great, so I didn't really learn very much. But, I, you know, I was writing these books, and I was quite, I was getting a bit frustrated with writing straight horror because I kind of quite like to blend bits of genre, and I was reading Michael Marshall Smith, who then wrote under Michael Marshall, who'd written some thrillers that were sort of genre blending. Um, and John Connolly, obviously, was writing, so, you know, sort of uh, thrillers with supernatural edge. 
And I really wanted to try some different things, but, but leisure wouldn't allow that. But one of my leisure books was up for a British Fantasy Award for Best Novel. And when I went, um, I didn't win it, but when I went to the awards thing, an editor from Galantz over here was speaking to someone else and said, oh, does Sarah want to write anything else? And luckily the person they spoke to knew me and said, yeah, yeah, she really wants to do some sort of thrillery stuff. So we did a lunch and I pitched her what became, I think in America they called it the Forgotten Gods. Over here it was the Dog Face Gods trilogy, which Lionsgate are developing at the moment actually for TV. <clears throat> Um, which was kind of uh, Paradise Lost retold with sort of a British policeman. And, you know, it was very dark and gritty and crimey, but it had this weird kind of, you know, supernatural science fiction edge to it. And so then I've kind of, from there, I've always kind of tried to blend things. And some of my is a straight thriller. It's cross heart is a straight thriller. Uh, but, you know, I do quite like to bring different bits of different genres in when I can. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Well, that that brings up a great uh, question uh, for me to pose to you. Uh, it, it, your books uh, and a lot of other um, psychological thrillers are are very scary. That there are things about them that keep you on the edge of your seat and get your pulse pounding. And uh, you know, some t- you were kind of famous for yanking the rug uh, out from under the reader, and you know, just dropping something in our lap that makes us go, "Oh my <laughs> God, what kind of person is Sarah?" Um, <laughs> uh, f- for you, what separates horror from? Um, uh, psychological suspense or, or thrillers uh, because sometimes that line gets very blurry. Oh, it is very blurry. I mean, I would call Silence of the Lambs a horror novel rather than a thriller, you know? Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. Even though there's no supernatural in it. For me, I guess it depends what your primary emotion is when you're reading it. If something is truly scaring you, it's a horror novel. I mean, some people call Behind Her Eyes a horror novel. I was like, no, no, that's fun. <laughs> that book is fun. <laughs> yeah, like, that I laughed the whole way through writing that. I loved the characters. I loved the twistedness. But it, it played all the beats of a thriller. It didn't play the beats of a horror novel. You know, a thriller has to have your, you know, I think your clues have to be laid. You know, yeah. the, the reader has to get to the end and think, oh, actually, all those clues were there from page one. You know? For every, right. all the way through. However subtle the clues are, the clues should always be there. You should always be able to follow the path, you know. I mean, ghost stories and, and crime novels are very similar in that there's normally a dead person involved and you've got to figure out why they died. <laughs> Where in one, in one is that the dead person is still talking, you know, and the other one they're not. But, uh, you know, it's tricky. But I do think... Um, when you blend a genre, if you, if, you know, some people, are put a, if you put a ghost in a thriller, which I've not done, but some people, oh, actually I did in The Dog Face Gods, but I think the prime, if it's, a, if it's a crime novel, the investigation has to conclude by following the clues in a very human, alive manner. It can't be, oh, and the ghost leaves a clue. You know, that can't happen. So I think there's, you know, horror and thrillers, they are... They are quite intertwined. I don't think, I mean, I think psychological thrillers play on, um, play on much more closer to home fears in a lot of ways, don't they, than crime novels. You know, a lot of them seem to be focused on damage to your personal life, to your home, to, you know, to where you should feel safe. You know, they're kind of the, they're the book equivalent of home invasion films. <laughs> right. Yeah, right. There's exactly. A marriage, there's someone, your husband's lying to you, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, another thing that that kind of jumps out at me is uh, a lot of times horror uh, is kind of a a normal everyday uh, pedestrian person that's thrust in the midst of uh, this other stuff that's happening and and a lot of times in in thrillers and, and psychological suspense especially like behind her eyes um, you've got a story where uh, everyone might be evil uh, in, in the book you know you got <laughs> You've got manipulations and and uh, who is 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 playing whom and uh, I mean, you know that, I think that's another that, level. Yeah, I don't. I mean, that that is quite similar in that way. In that a lot of horror novels, you know, you have that person who suddenly plunged into something unusual. And psychological thrillers, rather than crime thrillers, are similar in that. You know, they are suddenly someone becomes unsure of the world around them, which is pretty much what a horror novel is as well. But what I found quite interesting is I've read quite a lot of um, advanced copies of a lot of crime writers now or psychological thriller writers 
are starting to explore with the supernatural. And what yes. I'm finding really interesting, coming from the background of the supernatural, and I did wonder, I was, I was thinking if I was ever going to do a workshop, I would do it on on how crime writers could write, to, could adapt how they work for writing these supernatural thrillers. Because because what they're doing, I'm reading in a lot of them, they're putting the scares way too up front, you know? Because right. in a crime novel, you have a body up front. So crime novelists are used to whacking a body in on page one or page five, you know, so they're chucking a scare in on page five. And I kind of think, no, with horror, you've got to build the atmosphere much more slowly. You know, you've got to believe in that world before you can be scared in that world. Right. If I have if I have a ghost in a bathtub on page 10, I'm not buying it. You know, <laughs> I'm not there. So it's quite interesting, the differences, you know, because of the, a crime, you know, a lot of horror novelists will concentrate on atmosphere when they're trying to write a crime novel. Whereas actually in a crime novel, pace is what counts. Right. So it's really interesting how you can have people that are so skilled in their own genres. And then when they try and mix in a different genre, they don't know the beats of that genre well enough. It's kind of, you know, I mean, I'm the same, I'm sure. When I, you know, I'm, you know, I'm sure my pace is off sometimes. Obviously, obviously not in Cross Our Heart, which is just <laughs> amazing. It, it is it's absolutely amazing. <laughs> Uh, Sarah, when you when you switched genres uh, and and started writing uh, what you're writing now, was that a a difficult switch for you, uh, or did you feel like oh this is this is what I always wanted to write, uh, or you know do you just approach it as uh, you, the the clinical professional and uh, you know no matter what I do my process is the same I'm going to put my uh, my backside in the chair and I'm going to deliver the work. I wish I wish I was that professional. <laughs> <laughs> I think there were two things at work with when I when I did Behind Rise, which I mean, thirteen minutes is a YA novel, but that's very much a psychological thriller, and and it's uh, developing that from film. But um, that was my first kind of straight thrillery book, but it was for a teen audience, so it was slightly different. When I, I what I just realized was that I was reading ever since Gone Girl, I was reading a lot of psychological thrillers over genre fiction as in you know sci-fi or horror or whatever so I thought well I'm really enjoying r reading these so it's natural to then think you know I I want to have a go at telling one of these stories so um I'd been mulling it but I was still under contract with two other publishers and then HarperCollins UK came to me and said you know we really want you to write us something commercial you know we feel like you could be doing better than you are blah 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 so I was like all right and I said, but I'm, you know, I owe two books and I haven't got any ideas. And they said, well, just come up with a pitch for next week. It doesn't have to be brilliant, which means it has to be brilliant. <laughs> of course it does. <laughs> I'm like, going to write or panic. So I was thinking, right, I want to write about an affair. I want to write about a toxic marriage. I wanna... and I, but I was thinking, oh, all this stuff is, there's so much of this out there already. And then I kind of. I was thinking about, I'd watched Sunset Boulevard, I think, a week or so before. And the opening scene of that with um, the dead man starting to narrate from the pool. And then I just had my list of characters. And then I kind of came up with the twist at the end of that, the love it or hate it twist at the end of that one. And I thought, okay, this is my book. But with Cross a Heart, I've been very, it's hard to talk about without giving away the big twist. But I've been very fascinated with the subject matter that's at the core of that book. Um, you know, we've had some high profile crimes in the UK that are very similar to what is at the core of that book. Um, and I, so I'm very fascinated about the kind of people that commit those crimes or are involved in those crimes. So I knew it couldn't have any weird in it because it was too highly emotive to then add with any supernatural. You know, I figured it was powerful enough on its own. So it's, it's with me, it's more, I would never say this is what I was ever born to write because. I just like telling stories and I'm still, I've written a, you know, I've got a ghost novella in an anthology coming out um, called Hark, the, I think the anthology is called Hark the Herald Angels Scream coming out from Blumhouse. Uh, so I'm really happy with that. It's a Victorian ghost story. I still like sci-fi and stuff, but I, I pitch it for TV instead now. And I'm writing thrillers for mainstream because also I want to make a living and thrillers, you know, are a much more mainstream market and because you know i just like writing dark stories whether they be, have any weird in them or not but 
But, you know, I could never say that this, because I've actually got bored of reading psychological thrillers. I'm having a break because I get sent so many now, you know, and of course I give all these proofs to my mom, all these arcs. She's like, every book that's coming out seems to be a psychological thriller. And I'm like, no, mom, they're just the ones that I get sent. Well, yeah, well, we get sent a lot as well. And, and I, I absolutely love the genre. So, um, I, uh, you know, I, I surely don't mind, uh, mm-hmm. but but there do seem to be uh, kind of the ebbs and flows in in what uh, popular fiction uh, may be, and and we are definitely uh, in the uh, the tide in uh, portion of of psychological thrillers right now, and, and maybe that says something about us uh, as a society uh, as a whole. Um, I don't know, uh, but but we seem to be kind of obsessed with uh, lying, cheating. Um, Do you know? What I think it is. I think un- underhandedness. Because, yeah, and I think um, because we live in economically difficult times, so we are more unsettled in our lives in the way that my parents. You know, they saved. People don't save these days. People have credit cards. It's much easier to cheat because people have Facebook, email. Mobile phones, you know, it's much easier to be distracted by something new in these days than it ever right. was 30 or 40 years ago. Whereas if someone was, if someone was sleeping with their secretary or whatever, they had to call the home line. Who, you know, like now you can send a DM or a text or, you know, people have whole separate lives from their partners. Um, so I think there is a, that. And, and then if you tie in with that, People have big mortgages and un- uncertain job markets. And, you know, we're all quite worried about our domestic stability. You know, so I right. think so I think those it's a bit like, you know, so it's better to read about those people having a really bad time in a book <laughs> than to think it could happen to you. <laughs> you know, right. so I think that's part of it. I think it's really interesting to to look at characters who have kind of. Uh, come of age in, in this time. And, and maybe, uh, me and you, uh, remember a time before social media kind of dominated everything and where things, uh, like, like you said, were, were more difficult and, 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 and now thing, it's, it's almost like we built a society, uh, just to exploit the, the, uh, the worst side of us. And, and and maybe it's 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 fun to kind of remember to to be able to step back and see you know I remember a time when this was not that way, uh, and and it's fun to kind of look at how this plays out with younger people, uh, and and then how older people get caught into it. it's it's a really interesting way to look at the world. It's fascinating, isn't it? I mean, I yeah. see my friends' kids who are constantly connected, even if they're playing an, a computer game, they're talking to their friends who are playing the game at the same time, you know, and all the it's just a whole different world. But I think for my generation, I mean, I'm mid forties, and too. I actually are you high Dying. five at seventy. <laughs> um, I think a lot of us are actually now starting to take a step back from social media. You know, I mean, like it yes. used to be my kind of communication with the world sort of medium, but since I've got this ridiculous dog who is more famous <laughs> than me, um, and I'm out in the morning, I've made so many friends dog walking, and I've started to rebuild my faith in humanity because they're not all on the internet getting offended by everything. And if someone uses the wrong term, I mean, one of my dog walking friends, his daughter is a vegan lesbian and she's just met this new partner. It's all very exciting. And he's like such a blokey bloke. You know, you would not have put those two things together. <laughs> but another dog walking friend, she said something and she used some terminology, which if you were on the internet, you would have been hounded off Twitter. But she's a woman in her 70s. You know, it's a bit like my mum will sometimes say a coloured person. I'm like, mum, you can't say that. But... <laughs> The use of the word does not make her a racist, you know. It's just, it's just the terminology she grew up with. It's just like she's like, oh, God, can't I? Okay, well, you know what, I, you know. And so I think we, you know, I think in the real world, people are much more forgiving of each other. Sure. You know, you spend time face-to-face with people. So now, I mean, I think, God, sometimes I go on Twitter and I throw something on that I think is really offensive just to see what will happen. <laughs> but because I've been so offensive in the past, no one cares. It's just, oh, Sarah's being silly. She's had a glass of wine. But, you know, I think most people in the real world actually quite like other people. Sure. You know, face-to-face. I have a... I'm, I'm, you know, I know it's not cool to say it, but I actually quite like people <laughs> and I'm quite interested in people. And I think if you scratch the surface of most people, even people you massively disagree with on so many issues, you can find some common ground, whether it be humor or 
and I think we need to concentrate more on face-to-face interaction than, than internet interaction. Oh, absolutely. And I, I make it a point to on, on social media to just not get into the minutia of of what's going on because uh, circumstances and, and people change uh, almost daily. And, and when you take, uh, you know, stands for, for one thing or another and the next week new information comes out, you, you have a tendency to, to look like an idiot. Yeah, and, it's a fake thing, isn't it? No one reads anymore. Everyone reads the headline. No one reads an article. And I saw, I remember with, I mean, and I may well be wrong on this one because obviously I'm not an American citizen. But I remember just seeing a, a whole thing about when John McCain was voting in that health bill thing. Right. And I was seeing all these tweets saying, oh, my God, he's against Obamacare. And then he voted the other way to keep it. And right. I was like, actually, if that, this is more convoluted than people are making it out. <laughs> you know, I was like, there is a little bit more going on here. Right. But, you know, the, so no one goes away and reads the articles anymore. Yeah. You know, or look for four or five different sources. I find it, I mean, I am a very much a middle ground person. I'm quite, you know, the richer you become, the more right wing you become in certain extent. And you have to try and balance that out. You know, it's, you yeah. have to find the middle ground. I'm kind of a natural sort of liberal, you know, I kind of see the points of most sides, but I sometimes think you've got to bite the bullet and make it better for everybody. You know, right, like, right exactly. A bit more, you've, you've got it. It doesn't matter, you know, that kind right. of thing. Well, I, I like to tell people that, that if you want to discuss uh, politics and things like that, I, I would love to have you uh, at my house for dinner, and, and let's talk about it o- over over a meal, uh, because it's really hard to look someone in the eye and call them horrible names, yeah. uh, but it's so very easy on the internet. Well, we, I went to this weird, it was like this weird kind of, on the top of the old BBC building in Shepherd's Bush, they had this space that people could hire out and do pop-up stuff. And there was this pop-up Indian dinner night for charity, and it was like five courses. And I went with a friend of mine because uh, another friend of mine was the chef on the night. So I took a friend and we went, and we ended up sitting next to, I think they might have been from Mississippi, actually, this American couple, at completely opposite. Like, they were very gun-supportive. Of course, I'm English. We don't <laughs> get that. But had that been an Internet conversation... It would have descended into, you're an idiot. No, you're an idiot. No, you're an idiot. No. But actually, because we actually like this couple, and I thought, well, these are nice people. What is their rationale? And they were looking at us and thinking, well, these seem nice people. What is their rationale? And we kind of found a middle ground over the evening yeah. that we could have all lived with, you know, yeah. whether that was only for the evening or not. But I just, you know, it's those things. I think it's not worth it. People get so angry. It's just yeah. unhealthy. Well, what's so I, weird I as... Like, instead <laughs> yeah and, and to to bring this back around to writing uh it, it's so weird that that writers love to put on a persona um that that we uh don't like people and and we like to sit in our dark rooms and and write all day and we are uh, introverts and, and we made the introvert joke earlier um all in good fun listeners um yeah. <laughs> but um it, you know, but we put on this persona, and, and but at the heart of it, uh, we tell stories about the human condition. We tell stories about how we interact with one another, and um, you know, maybe the the uh, the last bit of 2018. Could we put off our airs and just admit who we are and what we got into writing for? I, I, I do think find it'd be it quite fascinating with writers, though, because I think the internet has created a world of monster writers. You know, what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's not. You know, if I was a plumber. I wouldn't be going on the internet going, God, I am plugged, I am blocked a toilet today. It was hard work. You know, whereas writers <laughs> would be on there going, God, there's 500 words. They're the most beautiful words I've ever written. I'm just like, oh, come on. It's, it's not brain surgery. If we write a bad book, you know, it hurts our ego. Right. And right. Our, you know, but it doesn't, it, no one dies, you know. <laughs> and I do think that I see, like, especially debut novelists who maybe had, and you know they've only sold, like, 400 books but they're on twitter making proclamations about their fans and there's immediate black strike if you're not jk rowling or stephen king don't tell me you have fans you know right. like, you have readers maybe if you're lucky <laughs> you don't have fans you know right. but it's, just kind of, it's created this monstrosity whereas i'm kind of like you know what i was a teacher before this and that was a proper job that was hard and rewarding and i mean i love being a writer but it's 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 not and it has its hard moments, but it's certainly not 
you know, anything that that is to be exalted over any other job. I'm very kind of, you know, my mum's very working class. She 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 wouldn't let my dad have an MBE. You know, like she's very, you know, you don't get an MBE for just doing your job, Roy. You know, there are firemen who don't get MBEs. You're not having one. So that, you know, I'm very much that kind of. I, I do think that there's, there's, the, the social media is created. You know, there's always people giving out writing advice every two minutes. Like, you know, I think it's better people just get on with it themselves. If you're going to write a book, you'll write a book. Someone on the internet telling you the best way to do it is not going to help you, you know? Just do it. Have faith in yourself and do it your own way. Make your own mistakes. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, uh, Stephen King's book on writing uh, gets lauded by lots of people. It's a fantastic book. Yeah. Um, but he gives some really specific writing advice uh, that other authors uh, just throw out the window and uh, and, and go – you know, exactly opposite of, you know, and, and, you know, I've heard, you know, Stephen King has the rule, you know, never use uh, adverbs if you can get away with it. And then Neil Gaiman sprinkles adverbs everywhere. So who, so who's right? Exactly. You know, you know yeah. it's all about the story at the end of the day. If you've got a great story, the rest will come together, you know? That's right. That's right. That's right. Uh, so let's, let's talk about Cross so Her Heart. alienated. Half of half of the writers. Yes, that's right. So now, so now let's talk about your new book that we want everyone to run out and buy uh, right now. Uh, Cross her heart. Uh, I've had an arc of this book for for uh, a good while now, and it is an absolutely amazing book. Uh, and the the things I said earlier about you pulling the rug out from under us and and you know dropping horrible things in our lap, all that's true. Um, but you, you're you are also right that there are some. Some twist here that, that we, we need to step lightly, uh, around when we're talking about this because there are some things that I definitely don't want to give away. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll let you, uh, decide <laughs> how deep you want to go here. But, uh, having said all that, this is a story, um, it, it's, it's a family story and mm. it's a, it's a relationship story. And the way those things intersect, um, really kind of creep me out. And, and you see the kind of the best and the worst, uh, of people. Um, tell us, set the book up for us, uh, if you will, and, and tell us where, uh, kind of the situation came from that, that intrigued you enough to write about. Well, it's actually based very much on a real life case from England from the 60s which I've kind of changed and played around with and you know things are slightly different but um, I'm very interested in events that change us and how we hide those and how we change you know especially I, I think I'm terrified by the American penal system in some ways because you can have some 21 year old who ends up in prison forever yeah. with yeah. some stupid stupid thing you know that actually when they're 45 they're a different person. I look back at myself at, you know, 25. I could have gone down a terrible path. You know, I was hanging out with all the wrong people. And then I look at myself now and I think I'm very lucky to have, to have come out unscathed, you know, kind of thing. And, and um, if you would have been imprisoned at that age yeah, uh, for a stupid mistake, what, what you would be emotionally stunted there yeah. and, and never reached your potential. Uh, yeah, yeah, I would never I would never have been a teacher I mean I might have been a writer but it would still not have you know I was very yeah. lucky I had a good you know I look at I had a good upbringing I had you know private education because my dad was with the foreign office so you know I had a, I was a wayward child who luckily had a great background to rescue me from it as it were um, and I was also very interested in mother daughter dynamics because I think it, uh, you know I'm, I see my friends now they're all mothers and I'm fascinated by the fact that their kids only see them as mothers. You know, <laughs> they don't see that. You know, I know them when they were 20 and smashed on tequila, and you know that kind of thing. <laughs> so I think that you know this idea that women are very much categorised by mother, wife, you know, uh, daughter. We're you know we're very much placed in roles rather than seen as an individual who can can do terrible things and great things. You know, uh, and I also I I wanted to write quite a feminist novel, which I actually think this is because I think it's everyone who dictates the action in this book is a woman. You know, all the, all the action is dictated by women. All the reaction is women. And I, I'm hoping it shows the best and worst of women to a certain extent, you know, I, but I was, I was very keen on, cause behind her eyes is quite female centric, but it's all about a man really. Whereas this one is about the women's dynamics with each other and the 
the power of female friendship, I think. I'm not really selling it as a thriller here, but I'm, you know, it's hard to say because that sort of page 130 twist is where, it, you know, you kind of go, oh, okay, this is what we're dealing with. Um, but, yeah, I think I'm very much about gray areas. I don't believe in good people and I don't believe in bad people as a rule. I mean, obviously, there are some terrible people, but, you know, in the main, I think most people are capable of doing really terrible things in a really bad moment. Yeah. and how you recover from that and how and how those things can come back to you you have to make your peace with yourself i think maybe is what the book is about so tell me about this uh this mother daughter relationship uh mm. and uh what were you hoping uh that we the readers uh would um would take away from that or or how how we might be shocked uh by what you came up with Oh, uh, well, I think it's an interesting time for mothers and daughters at the moment because, you know, girl, teenage girls think they know everything, so it's very hard to police them. And obviously the teenage daughter in this, Ava, she is having a seat. She's been groomed online uh, by a new Facebook friend, uh, and she obviously thinks she's old enough to manage that. And even though her mother has tried to protect her every step of her uh, youth, as it were, you know, she... Sorry, that's my my phone binging. I've tried to turn it off. <laughs> it's coming up on my computer. I'm like, stop it. Um, I think, sorry, I've lost my trail. Oh, yeah, she's trying to protect her. Um, and But you can't. You can't protect them. You have to, at some point, trust them. But I do think it's about um, learning to see each other as individuals and yeah. love each other for that. You know, me and my mum don't, me and my mum have a quite a, a, a sparky, to put it politely, <laughs> relationship, but probably because we're quite similar. You know, as much as it actually makes me choke to say it, we're probably quite similar. And I, you know, when my dad died recently, and um, I was looking through some old photos to do the eulogy and the whatever, and it was amazing to see pictures of them, these young people. You know, when you kind right. of forget they had this whole life before I was a part of it. And I think that's kind of important in this. You know, it's about the individuality within that dynamic for both parties. Right. And and as the writer, um, being able to turn the camera, so to speak, and 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 see uh, the situation and this uh, the choices from this angle, and then looking at it from uh, from the other perspective, uh -huh. it, it really I, I think it makes the book more uh, more scary, more intense uh because i think we can all kind of see ourselves in this situation yeah and there's a few scenes in the book where i've got you see it from uh, the daughter ava's perspective and then you right. see it from the mom's perspective lisa and you think oh okay that you know with lisa didn't realize ava was watching or this that you know and i think it you know i'm very much about perspective and truth only being a matter of when you walk into the room you know that's only ever a matter, you know, you, two people can walk into a room a split second apart and see a whole different thing. You know, that, that's, I find that fascinating. Exactly. Um, the book is called Cross Her Heart. It's available everywhere. Uh, Sarah, this book, I, I know we've, we've barely scratched the surface on it, but uh, this is a book that people need to experience for themselves. Uh, and, I think it's uh, quite emotionally uplifting at the end of it, actually. I think it's got, you know, I think it resolves happily which I think is kind of, well, it's not happy, happy, but, you know, I think it, I'm hoping it has, for all the darkness in the book, I'm hoping it comes out of it with some light. Yeah, it's, it, you don't exactly put a, a ribbon on it at the end, uh, but <laughs> but we are left with a with a thread of hope, and, and I think that's, I think that's what we need. We, we don't need you to perfectly wrap it up for us at the end, mm -hmm. but we need to know that the world is not completely broken. Yeah. Uh, Sarah, it, it's been so much fun talking with you. I, I know you've got another engagement that you need to uh, run off to, but the book is called Cross Her Heart. Uh, it, it's available everywhere. We've got links to it in the show notes. Uh, if people are just discovering you for the first time, God forbid, uh, <laughs> where can they find you online and, and follow along and maybe dig into your, your huge back catalog and, and, uh, and just go along for the ride with you? Oh, they can find me mainly on Twitter, and I would be at Sarah Pimbra. Sarah Pimbero, I think you say that. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent.
Excellent. And uh, and you also have a website that you, you I post do, at. which I very rarely go to these days, but I do occasionally blog on, and that's sarahpimbra.com. Excellent. Uh, Sarah, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show thank today. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories Podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to hankgarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleaves' The Jason Crane Series. He led Jason to a small bistro. The door set tiny bells to chime as they entered. The place shivered with smells. Coffee, hot chocolate, and croissants. This, he said, extending his arm towards a woman in an apron, is Jennifer. She makes the best scones and is tragically spoken for. He kissed the woman's hand. She was plump in her fifties. She had left one curler to dangle at the back of her head this morning. If it's a tragedy to you, this is the first I've heard of it. She swatted at him with a menu. Why didn't you speak up twenty years ago, lady killer? Jason sat. Jennifer put a glass of water in front of him. And who is this fine gentleman? This said Hedwick, joining, is my son's great-grandfather's great-great-nephew. That's a lot of greats. Any great-great-great-whatever of Hedwick is great by me. She giggled at her own wit. I'll be back for your orders. Hedwick swatted her rear end with a menu as she left. He made small talk about the bistro, the specials, what was good, the Benedict, or not so, the hanger steak. When their orders came coffee for both, eggs for Jason, a scone for himself. He got down to business. I met your grandmother about, oh, a year ago. Valerie and I have a mutual interest in old families, particularly old families related to the legend, for obvious reasons. Valerie's lived in Terrytown for years, though her family's up near Boston. Now don't worry, I don't believe all that nonsense about a headless horseman. Valerie's the superstitious one, but the Van Brunts are definitely the family in Irving's story. Hermanus Van Brunt and his wife Agatha were farmers in the village back in 1780 or so. This was during the Revolution. Hermanus grabbed title to lands left by a Tory family who'd been tarred and feathered and shipped back to Britain. Do you know your history? Sure, Tory, loyal to the king. Benjamin Franklin broke with his own son who was a Tory. Smart boy. Traitors to the cause, and that was serious business. The British marched straight through here during the war, chased George Washington off Manhattan and out to New Jersey. And after they were kicked out again, a lot of Tories were kicked out with them. Anyway, the Van Brunts took over some farmland north of Terrytown. They had a son, Abraham. And, of course, their son Abraham married a wealthy heiress. Katrina Van Tassel. Yes. All that is true. It's public record, just like the legend says. My mother left behind quite a few documents written by Abraham Van Brunt, Brahm, in Dutch mostly. He was powerful around here. With Katrina's money, he became the biggest stone merchant in the state. He died in 1850. After him, it's Dylan Van Brunt, his son Joseph, the grandson, then Cornelius, then... Sorry, genealogy is... Not my thing. No? Why was Eliza doing research on the Van Brunts? She wasn't. She was looking into the cranes. That's what made us such fast friends. I don't get it. We do go back a ways, your family and mine. More coffee? Jennifer appeared at Jason's elbow. Hedwick nodded and she poured. Still not getting it, said Jason. But he did. Hedwick turned to the waitress, and Jason knew what he would say. My lady, may I present? He raised his coffee cup, proclaiming, The last descendant of Ichabod Crane.